Welcome to Dad Man Talking. Tonight's story is part three in this incredible, exhilarating series by the incredible mind of Silent Urge 6. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Warning Call Part 3 Let's get straight into that. The bright sun high in the sky, birds singing their songs and a fox bends down to take a sip of the cool water from the recent rain. Two chipmunks chase each other through the branches of a tall oak tree. A flock of geese fly through the sunlit sky in their signature V-shaped form. A group of white-tailed deer graze in a field. Two does, a fawn and a young male. They slowly progress through the field, ever so cautiously. And her green eyes are fixed on the deer. She took a deep breath and suddenly the deer took off, leaping through the field. Fuck, Erin says. That would have been a gorgeous shot. Erin lowered her camera as she stood to her feet. It had been four years since her fiancé, Mad Lindau, was taken from her. By what? The government agents never really did clarify. They showed her and her friend photos of a werewolf, and then were told that there was no sign of her fiancé or his friend, Dale Cullins, and that this issue had been resolved. Erin had sold her house. She also received the money from Matt's life insurance policy and decided to leave town and go see the world. And she was in Africa on a safari where she discovered her new passion, photography. Erin then went and purchased a top-of-the-line camera. She got a job working for the Discovery Channel. Yet, with all of these changes in her life, she could not forget what had happened to her fiancé, Matt. Erin places her pack in the back seat of her Jeep Wrangler, closes the door and jumps into the driver's seat. She takes a breath as she checks herself in the rearview mirror. On her way back to her home, she receives a call from her old friend Lisa, Dale Cullen's girlfriend. And Erin ignores the call. Her phone vibrates in the seat again. And she answers. I'm driving. What's up? Erin says. Erin! Erin, I found him! I-, I fucking found him! It's been two years and I finally found him! Erin is confused. Found who? She wondered. What are you talking about, Lisa? Erin hears Lisa fumbling around with her phone. I can't believe it. He's been hiding out in the north. It took me forever, Lisa says. Lisa, who the fuck are you talking about? It was Sergeant Richard O'Neill. He was a highly decorated Marine. He was part of the special operations for the US government. And then he enlisted with a special sector of the government, Lisa said. Erin continues to listen to her old friend ramble on about this man. Lisa, get to the point. He works as a guide now for the state park, 150 miles from where the guys went missing. I'm heading there now. I just sent you the location. Please, meet me there. He is the only one that has the information we need. We? What information is her friend talking about? Erin thinks she's taken so much time trying to cope with the events that happened almost four and a half years ago. Erin? Are you there? Yes, Erin responds. Send the location. I'll meet you there. Erin hangs up and looks at the location. It's in the middle of nowhere, and she clicks on it. The bones crunch. Blood and intestines lay on the ground next to its body. Large claw marks going through the creature's abdomen. The creature makes its last sound as he rips a bloody chunk of meat from its mangled body. His ears twitch as he hears a cry in the forest, and he stands to his eight-foot height, his black and red fur glistening in the rays of the sunlight coming through the trees, his massive clawed hand holding the creature's arm. He takes one last bite from his prey. Blood, flesh and bits of bone slide down his throat. The crimson liquid falls down his toned slender body. It looks in the direction of the scream. His icy blue eyes narrow as he drops the arm of the dead human on the ground and he bursts off towards the screams. 
and a male human shot at him when he ripped through the tent. The female, huh, she ran in fear. He got his revenge on the male, that was for sure, an agonizing death as he ate the creature alive. The female, however, her death, I will be quick. He leaped down the small hill as he took a breath in. He could smell her. She was close. He stops as he digs his massive claws into a tree, his ears flicking at every sound, his eyes scanning his surroundings. And he slowly creeps towards an uprooted tree. He knows she is there. He can smell the fear radiating from her, the scent of urine, followed by a whimper. Oh, he was salivating at the thought of tasting her flesh. And does it taste like the males? And as he comes around the tree, he can see it. The pathetic human, curled up in a ball, water falling from its eyes. He leans down. His nose touches her face as he inhales deeply. The human's eyes meet his. He lets out a deep, guttural growl as he shows his blood-stained fangs. A small gasp of air escapes her lips as the blood flows from the gash in her neck. He throws back his head and lets out a howl. Hey there, welcome, the young park ranger says as Erin rolls down her driver's side window. What are you here for today? Hunting? Fishing? Hiking? You need to show your permit before I let you pass, says the park ranger. Uh, hey, I'm here to meet my friend, responds Erin. Uh, we're going on a hike. Okay then, that's a $50 entrance fee. Erin rolls her eyes as she handed the young man two $20 bills and a 10. The park ranger takes the money and handed Erin a blue pass. Erin's phone starts vibrating as she thanks the park ranger and begins to pull away. Oh, hello? Erin? Where are you? Lisa says. I just had to pay $50 for a blue piece of paper. Oh, great! Lisa says, a hint of laughter in her voice. I'll continue up the road. Follow the signs to the welcome station. You'll see me outside. Erin says nothing and hangs up the phone. Oh, I can't believe I'm doing this, Erin says out loud. Wow, Erin exclaims as she sees the beautiful mountain range in the distance. She was in so much awe that she almost missed the left turn she had to make to reach the welcome station. And Erin slowly approaches the welcome station as she sees Lisa waving her arms as if she was trying to flag down a cab in Los Angeles. The brakes of the jeep begin to squeak as the vehicle comes to a halt in front of Lisa. Lisa runs to the driver's side door as Erin exits her jeep. Erin, sweetie, I found him. Lisa says she extends her arms out to hug her old friend. Oh, hi, Lisa. You look great. Lisa is a beautiful slender woman, long curly brown hair and blue eyes, a beauty herself. Thanks, babe, Erin replies. So, are you going to tell me what we're doing here? This was almost a four hour long trip for me. Well, like I said, I found a man that was part of the team sent in to find the guys. Lisa replies in excitement. He works here as a tour guide. The receptionist in the welcome station said that he's three and a half miles up the intermediate trail. I figured we could hike up to where he is and talk to him about what happened. Lisa says. Now a tear fell down Erin's cheek as she replied to Lisa. Oh, sweetie, I've worked so hard to try and get over what happened to Matt and Dale. I can't fall backwards. Aaron, I haven't been able to move on. I've dedicated myself to finding out what happened. You remember the men that came to your house? King and Stone? I tracked down Stone and I was able to find out what really happened to the team. They were ripped apart by what they call big black dogs. Uh, dog men. Richard O'Neill was the only survivor on the team. He knows what happened. He can provide us with details that no one else can. He can give us closure, Erin. Real closure. Lisa yells at Erin as she has tears falling from her eyes. Erin takes Lisa by the hand. She wipes Lisa's face of tears. Okay, Lisa. I'm with you. Let's go find this dude. Thank you. Lisa exclaims as the two friends share a teary-eyed hug. How far are we from the waterfall? Asked Ned. Yeah, about another mile, answered O'Neill. Oh, this hike has been great, Linda said. Yeah, for real, replied Ned. 
Those out grazing in the valley, and those walls we saw on a ridge overlooking the river, it was awesome. My art and nature here is amazing. One of the many reasons why I love it here, O'Neill says. Well, thanks for being our guide. You've made this experience great for us, said Linda. Yep, agreed, said Ned. Your knowledge of the land and the wildlife that inhabit the area, well, that's astonishing. Uh, you said you were a marine, right? Ned questioned. Yes, that's correct. Five tours of Afghanistan and two in Pakistan, O'Neill replied. Well, how do you know so much about tracking the wildlife here? asked Ned. Well, it just comes with the territory of being a guide here. O'Neill says as he scans the tree line. The group continues walking the path. Tall trees and brush surround them. The hike to the waterfall was for avid hikers. The terrain was rough. Rocks and boulders a steep incline. The warmer weather made it harder since the rains happened more frequently, making the trails quite muddy. And the group continues making small talk as they ascend the last few feet to the foot of the waterfall. Wow! exclaims Ned and Linda. This is beautiful. Thank you so much for this, Ned said as he pats O'Neill on his back. How tall is it? Linda asks. <laughs> Fucking high. <laughs> Ned laughs. Ah, it's about a hundred feet or so, give or take, answered O'Neill. Linda and Ned start snapping photos of the waterfall and the surrounding area. Linda is looking up the waterfall and she sees a flash of brown move from the ledge of the waterfall. What was that? Linda questions. What was what? said Ned. I thought I saw something up there. Linda pointed to the top. O'Neill looks up. He has been very wary since his encounter four years ago. He has been told by hunters and other hikers of strange sightings of large creatures. Well, whatever it was, it's gone now, Ned said. The creature takes deep sniffs in through its nose. He can smell the stink of those creatures. He's had run-ins with them. Their teeth are long and sharp. Their ability to swing through the trees suddenly makes them unpredictable. His eyes see blue eyes narrow as he sees a small one sitting at the cliff's edge. He gets down low as he suddenly creeps towards the creature. He sees the creature looking over the edge of the cliff as if he was studying something. No matter to him as he was hungry from his travels through the wilderness. This creature will make him a hearty meal. He moves closer and closer, his eyes fixed on his prey. He is within striking distance now. He moves swiftly and silently towards the beast. His claws dig deep into the Gugwe's throat as his huge hands wraps around its neck. He pulls the beast towards him. Before the young Gugwe can make a sound, he rips its throat away. Blood flows from the gaping hole. He watches the creature's eyes roll back into its head, and he bites down with his razor-sharp fangs. Wed rips and the sound of flesh being devoured fill his ears. His eyes filled with intoxication as he continued to feast. He then stands to his eight-foot height as he picks the bloodied limp body in his jaws and turns to walk into the forest. His pace quickens as he moves up the mountain, moving through the dense brush, his claws gripping the forest floor. He comes to a cave. His ears twitch as he hears something inside the darkness. A solid thump as he drops the body of the young Gugwe to the ground. He sniffs in deeply. The darkness smells of blood and urine. A layer of another creature, perhaps. He moves into the darkness, quietly moving. He hears a low growl come from the dark. He prepares himself for a fight as this cave was about to become his. He roars in challenge to whatever commonly occupies the cave. And a huge force crashes into him. Fangs pierce his shoulder. He lets out a roar. He rolls with the creature. Teeth and claws connect with flesh and bone. He pushes the creature off of him as he gains his feet. And standing to his full height, he extends his arms, his monstrous claws ready to rip away flesh. He growls in anticipation of the coming victory. And the red eyes of the beast wide, teeth bared, a whooping roar comes from the creature. It slams its huge fist into the hard, cold ground of the cave before it charges towards him once again. He sidesteps as the beast clumsily slams into the wall of the cave. He pulls the beast to the ground by the fur on its back, slamming it hard into the rocky ground. And in a flash, he is upon him. He sinks his fangs into the creature's face and neck. Shrieks of pain escape from the creature's maw 
as his fangs rip into its red eye, cheek, neck, and top of its head. The creature tries to break free of its grip, but it's no use. He has now put his full weight onto the creature's body, and in one motion he rips the left side of the creature's face away. Screams of agony echo throughout the cave, where he raises his massive clawed hand, extending his claws as he slashes downwards. His claws sink deep into the creature's flesh, ripping away its internal organs. He throws his head back and howls in victory. The howl echoes out of the cave, and he humps as he turns to walk towards the entrance of the cave to collect his prize from earlier. He steps from the darkness of the cave and sits back on his haunches, flicking his ears from side to side, listening to the forest. And satisfied, there are no longer any present concerns. He grabs the young Gugwe from the ground and proceeds back into the cave. O'Neill looks up at the sky. The sun has just peaked, and a female voice fills his ears. Uh, hey, are you Richard O'Neill? Lisa screams. O'Neill turns to see the two women walking briskly towards him. Ah, uh, yes. And Ned and Linda turn as Lisa and Erin approach O'Neill. Uh, who are they? Linda asks Ned. I'm not sure, babe. Ned says puzzled as he observes the two women. Uh, were they supposed to be a part of the hike? Linda asks. Eh, no. It was just us, answers Ned. Lisa Vick stands her hand to O'Neill as she says, Hi, I'm Lisa and this is Erin. We've been looking for you for quite a while now. Oh, you have. Erin snaps at Lisa. Anyway, Lisa continues, You were part of the team that went to go look for Dale Cullins and Matt Linda, right? I don't know what you're talking about, miss. Your whole team was wiped out by those dogman monsters. You were the only survivor, Lisa said. Hey, look, miss, O'Neill says as he steps towards Lisa. Hey, you had the wrong guy now. Move along, now. Ned and Linda looked intrigued. No, Lisa says. I know who you are. You're Sergeant Richard O'Neill of the United States Marine Corps. Highly decorated. You were part of a government agency that deals with crypt... Ah, look... O'Neill says as he grabs Lisa by her shoulders, his eyes filled with terror, as the mental images of his encounters fly through his mind. You are asking about dangerous things. I know, Lisa said. They took my boyfriend, the man I love with everything. Her eyes filling with tears. Away from me. O'Neill steps closer. We're just trying to find out what really happened, as well as possibly get some closure. Please, help us. O'Neill releases Lisa and takes a step backwards. He looks at Ned and Linda, still looking on. Okay, let me get these fine folks back to the welcome station safely. Then we will go to my cabin and discuss this further, okay? Okay, responds Aaron. Oh, come on, sweetie, let's go. Aaron takes Lisa by her hand and guides her back down the trail. O'Neill exhales deeply. Ah, oh, fuck. He looks at Ned and Linda. Ah, let's go. Time to head back, folks. O'Neill puts his truck into park as he opens the door and steps out. He looks behind him and sees the two women getting out of their vehicle. He continues walking towards his cabin. Yeah, this way, ladies. Come on in. Lisa and Erin enter the cabin. O'Neill turns on the lights and closes the door behind him. Then engages the bolt to secure the door. Wow! Lisa exclaims. A stunning wooden interior, a nice comfy couch, a rocking chair with a glass top table in front of a 48-inch TV, a gun cabinet to the left of the kitchen entrance, holding a variety of weapons, including an M4A1 with an ACOG scope and flashlight, a HK416 with a holographic sight, lever action 450, and a gorgeous Remington 700 7mm with a scope, mag fed. Not to mention a few handguns and lots of ammunition. And to the left of the gun cabinet, a stuffed grizzly bear standing in all of its glory. A red fox with a winter tail, a few deer heads and a huge moose rack. O'Neill exits the kitchen, holding three beers and a bag of potato chips. I have a seat, says O'Neill as he hands Lisa and Erin a beer. O'Neill tosses the bag of chips on the glass coffee table. 
As he sits down and pulls a forty caliber Beretta and places it on the stand next to him, and Erin sits and sips her beer. Now Lisa, still looking at the interior of the cabin, says, "Well, oh, you have a beautiful place, sir. Plus, you're all the way out here." Yeah, I built it from the ground up. Has everything I'll ever need, including a big ass freezer chest and a generator in a basement. Well, that's great that you decided to cut yourself off from civilization and all. But can we skip the fucking small talk and you tell us what the fuck happened? Erin says in an angled tone. O'Neill looks at Erin. Are you sure you want to know? It won't bring your fiancé back, Miss Lance. Yes. That's why I travelled to the middle of nowhere. Erin! Lisa interrupts. What is wrong with you? Ah, it's all right, said O'Neill. I work for the government agency that dealt with strange creatures. Cryptids? Uh, dogmen? Lisa asked. Yep, yeah, dogmen. We encountered Sasquatch in good way as well. The Sasquatch were generally peaceful. They just wanted to be left alone. The good way we only encountered here or there. Nasty fuckers. However, the dogmen, huh, but it was something different entirely. O'Neill says as he stares at his beer. There are many different types of dogmen. Some have more human features. Others look like hyenas or African wild dogs, all depending on what area of the world you're in. And the canine ones, though, uh, those fuckers, well, they are ruthless. Definitely the most intelligent of their kind. They are stealthy, cunning, vengeful, and extremely fast and powerful. Their faces look like dogs or wolves. Their arms are long with raccoon-like hands and long, sharp claws. Their legs powerful. Some have a mane, and I've heard stories of them reaching 30 to 40 feet in height. Those were the kind we encountered while looking for Madden Dale. Our team and I were told to go in and exterminate the dogman, finding Madden Dale, or that was secondary. O'Neill continues to describe the events that took place. The two women listening intently, watching O'Neill as he relives that time four years ago, and the terror painted across O'Neill's face. He watches over the valley below. He can see the humans' concrete path they have laid through the land. His keen, icy blue eyes watching a human bent down by the side of a machine. Blue lights flashing on, a machine behind the other. Another two humans approach the first. He decides to move in for a closer look. He leaps down the hillside, moving silently through the trees. Not a sound coming from him. Now he is just a few yards away from the disgusting humans. He hears them communicating amongst themselves. His ears twitch as they pick up just the tiniest sounds. He bares his fangs, letting out a low growl. And one of the humans shines a light in his direction. What are they doing now? He wonders. The one shining a light pulled his weapon from his waist, as did the one beside him. The other human stood up and took two steps backwards. He lets out another low growl, a bit louder than the first. The two humans point their weapons in his direction. Their voices become louder and louder, fear overcoming them. He takes a step towards them, out of the cover of the trees. Holy shit! What the fuck is that? Shoot it! The man yells. Shut the fuck up! Ryan backs away slowly. Ryan, back away slowly, says the one state trooper to his partner. James, I have a shot, Ryan replies. No, don't fucking shoot it. Shoot, the man yells again as he opens the door of his vehicle. Ryan just backs away slowly. I asked one of those creatures folks have been seeing. If we leave it alone, it will leave us be. If you shoot, you just piss it off. Suddenly, a loud boom echoed out as the man had pulled a double-barreled shotgun from his vehicle, took aim and pulled both triggers. And he stares at the three men, fear radiating from them. His icy blue eyes move between them. He slowly takes a step forward, one human moving back, saliva dripping from his open maw. His ears twitch as he hears a click. Suddenly, he bursts forward. Fire zooms past him as he leaps through the air towards the man behind the machine. He lands on top of the machine, roaring fiercely into the creature's face. His hot breath and draw hitting a man in his face. The smell of urine fills his nose. He extends his toned arm and grabs the disgusting human by his neck, 
lifting him towards his face. And standing with the human clutched in his massive clawed hand, he begins to dig his dagger-like claws into the soft flesh of the human's throat, the warm red liquid trickling down his hand. Crack, 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 crack. Bullets fly through the air. He lets out a loud howl as the bullet hits him in his leg. He whips his head in the direction of the other two creatures behind him, the rage filling his eyes. He roars in anger. He throws the human in the grasp of the others as he bounds towards them. Shoot, James! Fucking shoot! Crack, crack! He collides with the human. His maw clamps down around the human's neck, and in one motion, he rips the human's neck away. Blood and flesh smack into Ryan's face and chest. He screams out in terror. Dropping the weapon, he turns to run. But it's too late. Massive, dagger-like claws stick into his shoulder and back. Ryan screams out in pain as he feels like a vice had just been clamped around him. The human screams louder as his grip tightens. Bones crack under the pressure. He then throws the human through the air. A loud crash as the creature slams into the machine. Ryan coughs as he hits the car, the air escaping his lungs. Blood falls from his lips and he is upon him in a flash. He slashes away with his claws, ripping flesh away with each swing of his powerful claws. Blood flows around them. He throws back his massive head as he lets out a victory howl. Wait, what is that? His ears flick and an approaching sound. He looks in a direction. Another machine. He lets out a low, guttural growl as he bounces towards the cover of the forest away from the bloody mess of mangled corpses. The squeaking of brakes as the vehicle stops just next to the destruction. A tall man with an athletic build steps out of the vehicle, his face weathered from his harsh life, a scar going down the left side of his face, going from his eye down to his chin. He moves his jacket past a holstered 357 Magnum on his waist. Removing a flashlight from his pocket, he clicks the LED light and it illuminates the gruesome scene before him. He slowly moves through the bloody mess, shining his light from one mangled body to the next. He bends down next to one and picks up an empty shell casing, then drops it to the ground. Fuck, this isn't good. Suddenly, a howl sounds from the darkness. He looks around, shining his light on the surrounding area. He quickly moves back to his vehicle, jumps in, and drives away. Now his icy blue eyes narrow as he watches the human. He grins at the thought of the recent events, the smell of blood and fear filling his nose. He cocks his head to the side as the human bends down. He lets out a low howl. He watches as the human gets into its machine and leaves the area. And he moves quickly through the forest, bounding past trees and over rocks and bursting through dense brush, following the human. A few hours have gone by since O'Neill, Erin and Lisa started their conversation. Wow, Lisa says as she takes another sip of a fourth beer. I'm sorry you went through that, Erin added. Yep, well that's part of the job, said O'Neill. Suddenly there's a knock at the door. Ah, who the fuck is that? O'Neill questions. Two more knocks at the door. O'Neill, open up, says a male voice from the other side of the thick wooden door. Ah, who the fuck is it? O'Neill yells out as he picks up his Beretta. O'Neill, open the fucking door, dude. Ah, no way. O'Neill thinks. Is that? And O'Neill opens the door. Stone, you son of a bitch. O'Neill pulls Stone through the doorway and throws a perfect ride across connected with Stone's chin. Stone hits the floor of the cabin. Ah, O'Neill, what the fuck? Stone says. Ah, you motherfucker, O'Neill replies as he grabs Stone by the collar of his jacket, lifting him to his feet. They die because of you. And Stone breaks free of O'Neill's grip and throws a hook that connects to the side of O'Neill's face. Ah, stop it, you fucking idiots, Erin yells. And the two men look at Erin. O'Neill picks up his Beretta and places it on the glass coffee table. Ah, what are you doing here? O'Neill asks Stone. I came here to find you. I'm sure you heard of the silence in the area and the surrounding state park land. 
Stone replied. Yeah, they're everywhere, you fucking moron. O'Neill said. Well, one or more is close. What do you mean? Lisa asked. I just passed by a mess of bodies on my way here. Two state troopers and a civilian. They were ripped apart. Rich, it was a bloody shit show. The troopers got some shots out, but it wasn't enough. Stone explained. Was it a dogman? Asked Aaron. Well, the carnage left behind, it sure looked like a dogman's handiwork. Well, if that's the case, we better fucking get ready. O'Neill exclaimed. I'm assuming that you stopped and assessed the area. It probably was still in the area and has your scent. Oh, fuck, Stone said. And suddenly, there was a loud howl. And Stone and O'Neill looked at each other. Oh, shit. You had to fucking say it, O'Neill. What the fuck was that? Erin says hysterically. That sounded close. Too close, Lisa added. O'Neill moved quickly to the light switch on the wall. Flicking the switch, the darkness outside lit up with white light. He then moves to the gun cabinet and removes the M4A1, six boxes of 556 caliber rounds and three magazines. Stone, that closet to your left, open it. Grab the tactical vest and toss it over here. There's another one for you. The stone opened the door and removed the two black tactical vests. Also inside the closet, a small cardboard box. Stone removes the box and opens it. A beautiful night vision scope, as well as the necessary attachments needed to attach the scope to a rifle. He removes the scope as he throws one of the vests to O'Neill. O'Neill, I'm assuming this beauty fits on the 7mm. Ah, you got that right, brother, O'Neill replied. Stone, heads up. And Stone lifts his head as Evan throws the Remington 700 to him. Stone gets to work, attaching the scope to the weapon. Evan removes the HK416 and the proper magazines. She starts loading rounds into them, then loads the magazine into the weapon and pulls the slide. And O'Neill looks at Erin. Ah, nicely done. And suddenly, a shadow quickly passes the window. Scratching on the side of the house can be heard. Then taps on the kitchen window. A firm thump against the east exterior wall. And growls can be heard outside the cabin. Fuck! Stone exclaims. We have to get the fuck out of here. No! O'Neill yells. That's testing us right now. Ah! <sighs> A shriek of a scream escapes Lisa's lips. They all turn to see a large silhouette peering into a window on the side of the house. Pointy ears, peering eyes, and the creature's breath fucking up the window. Stone and O'Neill raise their weapons. A deep growl emerges from the creature. White fangs appear. Suddenly, gunfire erupts. Crack, 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 crack. Loud footfalls can be heard as the beast retreats back into the darkness beyond the lights. What the fuck? O'Neill yells as he turns to see Lisa holding a smoking 38 caliber pistol. Are you out of your goddamn fucking mind? Stone says. I'm sorry, Lisa says as she shakes. O'Neill had grabbed the empty 38 from her trembling hands. It was looking at me. It freaked me out. Suddenly, a smash against the front door of the cabin. O'Neill and Stone quickly turn, weapons at the ready. O'Neill switches his weapon to full auto. Stone. Upstairs, brother. It's a loft up there. See what you can spot with the MV scope. They're on it, Stone declared. And Erin quickly takes position next to O'Neill, holding the HK416 steadily in her hands. And the wind blows through his black and red fur. His ears bend slightly back. His muscles ripple as he pushes off the hard forest floor, about in ten feet or more effortlessly as he keeps pace with the human's machine. The human scent is still fresh in his nose. The scent of this one is familiar to him. He has the odour of death upon him, a scent he is familiar with. The machine begins to slow as it turns onto a small path that cuts through the forest, and he quickly turns. His claws grip the ground beneath him as he slightly tilts his body to compensate for his speed. The machine follows the path as he moves to the higher terrain so he can clearly observe the area as the machine comes to a stop in front of a wooden human layer. He lets out a low growl as the human exits his machine and walks towards the structure. His ears twitch. Something is approaching him. He lets out a deep growl. His icy blue eyes peer through the darkness. 
and a silhouette appears. He stands to his massive eight-foot height as he bares his fangs and lets out another deep growl. The silhouette moves closer to him as it lets out a growl. His ears twitch at the sound and he sniffs deeply. The silhouette begins to take form. A huge head appears in the moonlight, deep amber eyes peering at him. A black, seven-foot-tall dogman with a brown thick mane stands in front of him. Broader than he is, a barrel chest, long muscled arms leading to large hands with equally large claws, strong canine legs and a short tail. The massive beast snarls at him. He narrows his icy blue eyes as he stands his ground, his claws extended, ready for an upcoming battle. He wastes no time. He moves in with a flash, digging his claws into the black furred beast's side. His other clawed hand closes quickly around the beast's neck. He slams it hard into the ground, and he roars, pinning the other dogman to the ground. It thrashes about, trying its best to break free. He slashes the beast across its face, his claws leaving their mark. He takes a breath as he releases his grip. The black dogman regains his feet. Placing its massive hand on his face, it lets out a low whimper, as if to say it surrenders to him. When he stands tall, it lets out a low howl in victory. He turns his head towards the wooden structure again, and lets out a low growl. The black dogman takes a step forward as it looks at the wooden structure. He nods and takes off towards the structure. And suddenly, bright lights appear lighting up the dark forest around him. He watches the black dogman stop and then quickly move towards the side of the house. He moves in as well to the opposite side of the cabin and begins to scratch at the wooden exterior wall. He sneaks over to the corner and suddenly watches his new companion. The black dogman moves along the side of the house. He places his massive clawed hand on the side of the structure and slowly he peers through the window. His amber eyes moving from human to human as he sizes them up. He sees the three of them with weapons. His eyes meet the brown-haired female. The fear pouring from her fills him with excitement. Her screams fill his ears. His ears twitch at the scream. The terror-filled sound is intoxicating to him. He lets out a low growl as his lips curl back into a smile. And suddenly, gunfire erupts. His icy blue eyes narrow. The black-furred dogman dashes away from the house and back into the darkness of the trees. He humps and turns the corner. He smashes his shoulder into the front door of the structure. Boom! Boom! Two gunshots into the darkness. He looks up towards the roof. He jumps twenty feet up to the peak of the roof. He lands with a solid thump. He sniffs deeply, his ears listening for the smallest of movement. He can hear a heartbeat coming from underneath him. He peers over the side and sees a small circular window below him. And the stone sets two boxes of 7mm rounds down next to him. He leans down and leans the Remington 700 bolt action rifle on the wall. He looks out of the small circular window in front of him. He quickly loads the magazines and injects one into the rifle. The butt of the rifle firmly sits on the crook of his shoulder. He chambers around and then leans his cheek on the stock as he closes one eye. The green of the night vision illuminates the darkness. He scans the trees. There, he can see the massive head of a monstrous, wolf-like creature. And he slowly takes a breath in as he gently squeezes the trigger. Boom! He missed. The trunk of the tree splinters. He quickly dashes to another tree. Stone chambers another round. Boom! Fuck! Stone says. A loud thump on the roof. Ah, oh, fuck. He looks up at the roof. He reaches for his Glock 17 on his hip. Automatic gunfire erupts. O'Neill, what the fuck is happening? A loud roar, screams of agony. Suddenly a noise from above. And Stone looks up. The roof is beginning to crack above his head. He lifts the 7mm and lets off a shot. And the monster growls in anger. He continues to break through the roof. Pieces of wood fly through the air. Another shot. This one just misses his left leg. And lets out a howl. He uses his massive jaws to rip away the final layer of the roof between him and the human below. Motherfucker! 
Stone raises his rifle. Claws swipe, knocking a rifle from Stone's hands. He roars as he drops down into the loft. Stone rolls out of the way as the beast drops down, and Stone raises his weapon. The beast dives towards him. He smashes into the human, and they both fall from the first floor. He rolls over the human and gains his feet. Stone lands on his side. Ah, oh, fuck! His side is now throbbing. Stone, cover your eyes and ears! Yells O'Neill. Boom! The bright light fills his vision. A loud ringing fills his ears. The dogman roars in frustration. Stone's vision is blurred. He feels two hands grab the straps of his vest. O'Neill drags him over the cabin floor into the bedroom. And slamming the door behind him, barricading the door with Erin's help. They use the dresser, the bed, another cabinet, anything that they could find. Erin, check Stone, O'Neill said. Stone, Stone, are you alright? Erin said while placing her hands on his face. Ah, yeah, I'm good, replied Stone. What happened to Lisa? Stone looked at O'Neill and Erin. Well, what the fuck happened to her? Ah, she's gone, O'Neill said. One of those things, it came right through the window and grabbed her. We unloaded on it, but it was too late. You already had her. Did you hit it? Yes, Erin said. Barely, it, it was fast as fuck. It didn't seem phased by being shot, though. It grabbed Lisa and went right back out the way it came. What happened to you? Ah, there was another one on the roof. Ripped through the fucking roof like a hot knife through butter. It tackled me like Ray Lewis. The next thing I know is all I see is white. Stone explained. Yep, it was that or you would have been food, said O'Neill. Well, I never thought I would have been happy to get flashbanged. Well, what's the plan, brother? Now the dog man is disorientated. His ears are ringing. He roars in frustration. These pathetic humans. He slams his body into a wall as he tries to regain his feet. His massive claws scrape across the wooden floor of the cabin, and he sniffs deeply. He can smell the humans. They are close, still inside. He stands to his full height and lets out a long howl. He hears heavy footfalls approaching him, and he bares his fangs. A low growl comes from the other dogman. His vision is clearing, and he sees the black-furred dogman scratching at the wall next to him. Suddenly, fiery lead comes blasting through the wooden wall. One hits the black-furred dogman in the side, another in its arm. A yelp escapes it more, and he quickly makes his way outside. He sees the humans running for the trees. He roars and gives chase, crashing through the remaining wall of the cabin. Wood flies through the air. The black-furred dogman quickly follows behind him. He moves off to his left to cut the humans off. Run, you fuckers! Run! Erin yells. Stone looks behind him and sees the black dogman hot on the tails. Oh shit! One is right behind us! Stone raises his pistol and starts letting off shots. Crack, crack, crack! The black-furred dogman hits the forest floor. I got it! Stone yells. O'Neill and Erin stop to turn and have a look. They see Stone approaching the dogman on the cold ground, blood beginning to stain its black fur red. Is it breathing? asked Erin. Ah, it doesn't appear to be, replied O'Neill. Come on, let's check, O'Neill said. Guns up. As Stone moves towards the beast with his pistol raised. I got you, you fucking abomination. Stone sees the dogman's upper body slowly moving up and down. Stone! Erin calls out. Careful, you idiot! I got it under control, Stone replies. Just then, the black-furred dogman opens its amber colored eyes. He quickly pounced on Stone, ripping into his chest with his fangs. Blood squirts from Stone's chest. Ah! Stone screams out in pain as the beast sinks its fangs deeper into Stone's chest. Stone squirms to get free. The sound of Stone's ribs cracking fills O'Neill's ears as the dogman pushes his powerful claws into Stone's side. No! O'Neill yells. Automatic gunfire echoes through the forest as Evan and O'Neill unload their weapons. Fur, blood and tissue fly through the air as the barrage of bullets penetrate the flesh of the black-furred dogman. 
and blood sprays in all directions. The massive beast drops to the ground, its black fur now crimson red. The warm liquid pools around its body. A howl sounds from the darkness around them. Aaron and O'Neill quickly eject the spent magazines in their weapons, reaching for another. They both insert another magazine as they scan the surrounding forest. <sighs> Aaron, we have to get the fuck back to the cabin. Why in the fuck would we do that? Aaron replied. O'Neill can hear the terror in her voice. And the truck is there. If we can get back to the town, we can get help, said O'Neill. It beats fucking being hidden alive, right? What town? We're in the middle of fucking nowhere, Aaron says. That's about four hours southeast of here, O'Neill replied. Oh, fuck. Okay, oh, let's do it, Aaron says as she feels her heart beating out of her chest, the HK-416 shaking in her hands. They begin to run back towards the cabin, the huts racing. Now he can smell the blood of his kind. He bursts through the forest towards the scent. The scent is getting stronger. His pace slows as he can see the humans through the trees. One of the humans is approaching his comrade. He watches as the black dogman attacks the pathetic human, ripping a bloody chunk of flesh away from its body. His lips curl back into a smile at the sight. He can hear the wet rip of the human's flesh being ripped away. Just then, the other two humans unleashed fire upon the black fur dogman. His body shook as the fire flew through his body, blood staining the ground. Rage filled him. He threw back his head, let out a howl. A warning call to these humans. They won't leave this place. And as he brings his massive head down, his icy blue eyes narrow at the two remaining humans. Suddenly, the humans take off running. He is intrigued. Where are they going? He wonders. He slowly approaches the defeated dogman. He bends down and sniffs deeply. He is reminded of when those humans destroyed his family. His eyes flew open wildly. Rage filled him. The scent. The scent of the other one. The scent of the one human. He had smelled that before. That human was there when his pack was taken from him. His mother. All the fur on his body stands up as he remembers the gunfire filling his ears, the smell of blood and death filling his nose. He roars like he's never roared before. It echoes through the wilderness. It was a roar of pain and anger. He begins to consume the fallen human, its blood dripping down his black and red fur, slopping wet lips. His ears twitch and he can hear the humans running through the trees. No matter, he will be able to catch them. O'Neill and Aaron approach the cabin, the two of them breathing heavily and sweat dripping down the faces. Holy shit, says Aaron. I need water. That's ah, in the truck. Hang on, uh, I need to go get something in the cabin, said. Uh, what? In no fucking way. That thing is out there. Who knows how far? Aaron says frantically. Uh, cover me, Aaron. O'Neill ordered while running into the cabin. Fuck! Aaron exclaimed. She walks out to the giant hole on the side of the cabin. She peers inside to see the blood from Lisa. Tears fill her eyes as she recalls what happened. The black dogman came from nowhere, bursting through the window and grabbing Lisa with his massive hand, digging his claws into her. The monster ripped Lisa's throat out, with blood and tissue splattering onto the floor and wall of the cabin. Then, just as fast as it had appeared, it was gone, carrying Lisa off in its massive jaws. Erin was staring blankly at the blood. I'm so sorry, Lisa, she says. Then, the sound of tree branches snapping brings her back to the present. Oh no, O'Neill! Erin screams. We have to get the fuck out of here! O'Neill comes running through the door, leading to the basement, carrying what appeared to be a rifle case, as well as a duffel bag. Let's go, he says to Aaron as he runs past her. Aaron and O'Neill run to the truck. Aaron quickly jumps into the truck as the dogman bursts through the trees. 
Come on, get in! Get in the fucking truck now! Aaron yells. O'Neill turns to see the black and red dogman just 30 feet away from him. Fuck you, you fucking son of a bitch! O'Neill pulls the detonator from his bag and pushes the button. Boom! The explosion knocks the dogman through the air. Now he can smell the fear coming from the humans. He's almost upon them. The one that took his family from him. And suddenly, fire and wood fly through the air. The force from the explosion sends him through the air also. And he crashes into a thick pine tree. A yelp escapes his maw as his breath is removed from his lungs. He sees the human through the window of the machine as his vision goes black. Holy fuck! O'Neill exclaims. I forgot how much C4 I put in the basement. Holy shit! What the fuck, you psycho? Aaron yells. Hey, it allowed us to get the fuck out of there without being ripped apart. O'Neill countered. Oh my god! Aaron says as she smacks O'Neill's arm. I get some rest, Aaron. We have about a four hour drive. Give or take. You might as well rest while you can. O'Neill suggested. Oh, sounds good. Erin says as she leans her seat back. And the morning sun peeks through the trees. The northern timber rattlesnake slivers through the grass, coming upon a giant mass. Its tongue tastes in the air. The giant mass begins to move. The snake coils up into a striking position. His icy blue eyes open as he sees the serpent in front of him, and he lets out a low growl. The snake strikes. His jaws close around the snake's head, severing it from the rest of the snake's body. He gains his feet as he swallows the head of the snake. He sees the smoldering wreck of the once wooden cabin. He walks towards the tire tracks, sniffing deeply, the smell of smoke and blood filling his nose. He shakes the ashes off his sleek black and red coat, and digs his claws into the ground as he pushes off the cold morning ground, heading in the direction of the scent of the two humans. What the fuck kind of town is this, Rich? Aaron says in an angled tone. Rich? Ha ha ha. First time for everything. O'Neill replies. Seriously? Says Aaron. And the town is set in the mountains, one row leading in and out. A few houses, a fast food restaurant, a general store, gun shop, gas station, post office, and a diner called Francine's Paradise. O'Neill pulls into the diner parking lot. Two trucks, a police cruiser, and a few motorcycles are already parked. The two get out of the vehicle and enter the diner. Hi, y'all. Welcome. Take a seat anywhere you like. An older blonde-haired woman says, Ah, thank you, says O'Neill. All eyes are on the two strangers. O'Neill and Erin sit in a corner booth. The police officer stands up and walks towards them. Ah, hey there, folks, the officer says. You two look like you've been through hell. Oh, you have no idea, Erin scoffs. Erin, O'Neill says in a stern voice. Well, what happened, says the officer. We were attacked by a beast. Erin, O'Neill raised his voice. The officer took a step back. Wait a minute. O'Neill looks at the officer. A terrified look painted across the man's face. Uh, can you describe it? The officer says. And the two look at each other. An eight foot black and red wolf like creature. Long sharp teeth and claws and icy blue eyes. Aaron says, looking confused. Black and red? The officer questions. Well, that's not the one we know. What? Oh, there's more? Erin says, tears filling her eyes. Uh, there's about three more, says the officer. Ah, fuck. O'Neill remarks. Suddenly, a howl pierces the atmosphere, long and drawn out, followed by another and then another, then followed by a deep, guttural roar. O'Neill and Erin stand up and walk to the window of the diner. The other patrons look at each other. Well, we're in for it now says the blonde-haired woman. And he approaches the ridge overlooking the small town. 
The wind blows through his fur. The scent of his kind is in the air. He sniffs deeply. Suddenly a howl, and then another, followed by another. His icy blue eyes narrow. His ears twitch. His lips curl back as he stands to his eight-foot height. He lets out a deep, challenging roar. Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one, wow. Absolutely exhilarating and phenomenal writing from our incredible talented good friend Silent Urge 6, exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. A mighty thank you to your Silent for penning this incredible update and I simply cannot wait for any updates. Of course, I hope you enjoy this as much as I and thank you so much for your patience over the last few months. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. My ad really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Critted Crew. Now if you think you can pen a story packing that much punch, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. A huge thank you for your patience and support, guys, over the last few months. It really is quite a struggle at the best of times, juggling being a single father and just life in general. It's been an emotional roller coaster of happiness and hard times over the past 15 months. But I never was a quitter, so if you can bear with me, I promise you there's lots more adventures in the pipeline. As ever, I hope you're all well and happy your family and friends alike. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.